together so that we're Felice says that she's leaving for Jackson Hole tonight sometimes and wants to be able to say goodbye to everybody. So this is going to be the session that's going to answer all the questions on the area of gastroenterology that in 40 years I still haven't been able to master. So I'm expecting answers, not BS. I'm expecting study designs and I'm expecting people to be close to being on time. No 30 minute lectures or I'll cut you off. So we're gonna talk about extraesophageal GERD, all its manifestations. We'll start with Reza Shakir from Milwaukee. Reza will talk to us about the physiology of the infamous or famous LPR. Joel, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope your heartburn and acid reflux doesn't get worse by the time I'm done. Um, how do I proceed with this? Here we go, I got it. So these are some of the complications of supraesophageal reflux disease, commonly known as LPR. By all, I always scratch my head uh, trying to analyze LPR, which stands for laryngopharyngeal reflux. And if you look at the Dorland Dictionary, reflux is defined as a fluid or something that comes from one cavity and goes into the other. I don't understand what comes out of larynx that goes to pharynx that causes problem. So that's the homework for you, Joel. Could you fix that? I got it. Good. So, and uh, there is a term or a field that is evolving and uh, you are probably, or most of you are involved in that called team science, which is transdisciplinary. It means the expertise from various disciplines comes together to solve a very complex problem. LPR is one of them. Unfortunately, historically, people or disciplines involved in it did not collectively work on it. And so the poor patients come from one office to the other, one procedure to, uh, to the other, and the total cost of that currently is estimated by Vanderbilt Group. Mike Vasey had a paper over $50 billion to the nation. So we have a problem. So I will limit my presentation on reflex mechanisms that putatively can prevent aspiration of material that orally migrates out of the uh, stomach and toward the lung. And to come up with really diagnostic and therapeutic uh, possibilities, we do need to understand first anatomy, which I think we do, physiology, which I don't think we do, then pathophysiology, maybe biology and pathobiology, then we could have a reliable diagnosis, diagnostic modalities and therapy. Unfortunately, the field of LPR has not gone through that leapfrogged into diagnosis and leapfrogged into therapy, so we need to backfill. As you see on the slide, we have two sphincters, LES, UES. Both needs to be overcome for the gastric content to reach the lung or the larynx or the pharynx and so on and so forth. There are four reflexes that start from esophagus, but their end organ may not be just in the esophagus. There are four reflexes in the pharynx that go everywhere, and I will review that with you. So here is an example of acid reflux, distal, and all the way goes up. 50% of you, after postprandially, have laid down. About 80% of reflux aid reaches the bottom portion of the uh, UES. Secondary peristalsis is an important mechanism. It's diminished in elderly, so a little pathophysiology. is diminished in esophagitis. Recently, there has been described a esophago, uh, esophageal distension. I have 20 minutes, Joel. There is something wrong with the clock. Yeah. Esophageal distension that causes swallow. So that's been described. There is also esophagobronchial reflex that has been shown increases the excretion of the mucus in the, in the bronchi and also reduces the mucociliary function as preparation for arrival of the, of the acid. The trigger is usually distension and tactile. In the pharynx, obviously, is just distension. So this is an example of one reflex that emanates from the esophagus and closes the airway. This is what we termed it years ago as esophagoglottal closure reflex, a rapidly adaptive reflex. And it is directly related to the duration of vocal cord closure 
to the magnitude of distension. You see the 2.5 distension of the esophagus with the balloon produces a longer period. Please pay attention to the blue portion. That's the real tight closure of the, of the vocal cord compared to 1.5 cm. If you push fluid in the esophagus, the same thing happens. If you study the glottis with a pH and a manometry uh, and look at the reflux in the esophagus, you see this vocal cord closure. Uh, um, it's very nice that it's rapidly adaptive, but otherwise we will be um, suffocated. So this is another uh, reflex, was discovered by Schlegel and Kramer in 1950s. Uh, the esophago UES contractile reflex is probably one of the most important protective mechanisms against aspiration. As you see on the left-hand side, as see on the left, that, that's the old manometry um, recording. On the left of the left, you notice a pH drop, the lower three panels, and then on top, you see the UES on very top, followed by esophageal body, and you notice the secondary peristalsis. So that's a reflux event causing contraction of the UES followed by secondary peristalsis. To right of that, you see another reflux event, it's more pronounced in the esophagus, that goes all the way to mid-esophagus, and then you notice the UES contracts, but there is no secondary peristalsis. And this can go on uh, 20, 25, 30 seconds. And on top, you see a new modern high-resolution manometry of an experimental reflux. Namely, we infused acid in the esophagus, and as you see the moment the magenta color, which is impedance showing the acid in the esophagus, is accompanied with severe contraction of the upper esophageal sphincter. And this is it at work to protect the airway. Now, this is an incredibly smart and sensitive airway. In this experiment, on top you see elderly, at the bottom are example of young group, and we are infusing 0 .0 0.05 ml uh, per second into the esophagus. So if you go for a whole minute, there will be all three ml of fluid in the esophagus. Please look at the bottom portion. You notice that when the magenta color begins, just halfway through, you notice the UES starts contracting. But it's important here to notice, the infusion stops at the border that we call passive dwell. At that time, we are not infusing, but you see the sphincter keeps contracting. And as long as fluid is there, it remains contracted. On top, that's the elderly, over 70 years of age. Not 65, 70. And as notice, this response is absent. So this pathophysiology of that. The extent of the study includes looking at the functional impact of that. So what happens if this reflex is not there? So this is an example, if you could play it. There's a it is an endoscope, laryngoscope, looking at the larynx. You have manometry, you have impedance, they're all synchronized, they're going together. The magenta reflects the infusion of acid. I think it was one ml per second. And everything comes through the lens, we clean it. You see that break? Secondary peristalsis, contraction, sphincter can't hold it, break. And the blue color comes up. Most of you missed it, so let's do half time. Next slide. <clears throat> you notice after a few seconds following the start of the infusion, you have a secondary peristalsis. On top of secondary peristalsis, UES is contract, but the sphincter can't hold. There is a break. And during that break, fluid rushes into the pharynx. Okay. So these are a group of individuals who complain of supraesophageal symptoms. They also complain of regurgitation. So this is a rather more severe kind of, of, the, of the problem. Thank you. So if you study this group, just about 20% of them can mount a UES contraction against esophageal fluid distension. There is no sense 
to do balloon distension because it's unphysiological unless you are studying receptors and so on and so forth. In healthy individual, you could trigger this reflex nearly 90%, given the limitation of the experimental model. That's not too bad. So that's what we are. Now, the next reflex I want to review with you is, uh, refers to the possibility. What about the fluid gets into the pharynx, somehow overcomes the LES, overcomes the secondary peristalsis, primary peristalsis, overcomes the UES. Now you have a few drops of this material in the pharynx. What happens? Immediately the body shuts off the entrance, which is the UES. So pharynx stimulation causes contraction of the UES. We called it pharyngo-UES contractile reflex. And you see that example here. And if to pay attention on the top, I think it's a small amount, maybe 0.5. I can't read it well due to age. But it's a small amount of fluid jetted posterior toward posterior pharynx. And the UES has jumped up. What else is in that tracing? If you pay, to, uh, pay attention to the LES, what happens to it? You see, LES relaxes. And that is a common phenomenon in all these reflexes. It does two things. Protects the airway that is upstream, open the gate downstream so the refluxate can clear. That's true for everything. So whoever designed this was very smart. This reflex is negatively impacted by age, smoking, alcohol, and reflux laryngitis. There are some evidence for that. So this is the uh, quantitative data. We looked at the bunch of smokers. We studied them before smoking, and we studied them after they smoke. And you see they require significantly higher number. Please pay attention. The volume required to trigger these reflexes are minuscule. It's about 0 0.2, 0 0.4. It's rather strange, but I will show you some other information in a few minutes. That's very important. Now, can you ask if this is a real phenomenon or not? Somebody has this reflex, you identify that. Why is this related to tactile stimulation of the pharynx? To answer that, we came and anesthetized the pharynx, which is actually very difficult if you are studying reflex, but somehow we managed. So you see the basal pressure on the left-hand side, about just under 60 ml. You rapidly infuse a, a jet of fluid, 0.2.3 ml, toward the posterior pharyngeal wall. You see peak pressure during rapid injection. It goes to 120. A slow infusion does that, but it takes a little time, but goes to that point. Then you anesthetize the pharynx and repeat the experiment. You see, none of those jumping increase in pressure does not happen. UES continues to be what it was before anesthetization, but the reflex disappears. So this is a true reflex. Now, this is another example that, uh, of a airway protection that basically have been ignored. We call it reflexive pharyngeal swallow. It's very similar to, to secondary esophageal peristalsis. So, if you look at the top panel, on the left, there is a bolus of barium on top of the tongue. The subject is asked to swallow. Look at the barium bolus. is moved into the pharynx on the third panel. And on the fourth panel on the right, you see the barium has gone. At the bottom, the same subject is holding the same volume of bolus of barium on top of his tongue. We have the catheter and all the gadget in his pharynx, and we are jetting 0.3 ml of water toward the posterior pharyngeal wall. Please notice that during that whole period, the barium at, on the top of the tongue remains, doesn't go through. But if you look at the pharynx, pharynx lumen closure closes, the hyoid bone moves forward and anterior. So there is a pharyngeal swallow that occurs that does not involve the front portion of the tongue. Now, you probably have noticed when you regurgitate sometime, you swallow, and that is a reflexive swallow. This is the most important airway protection because not only it closes the airway, it clears the fluid. So I will show you some data on that. So if, but if you grow old, you need significantly higher volume to trigger this reflex. If you smoke, 
you damage this reflex. You will need more. Now, the next reflex is the pharyngoglottal closure reflex. This is different from laryngeal adductor reflex, that you need touching the larynx and the pathway is different. The afferent of this reflex is GPN, glossopharyngeal, and it, this also weakens with, uh, with the age and a smoking. A slow infusion partially adducts the vocal cord. Rapid infusion closes it and is a rapidly adaptive reflex, closes it and opens. These are designed for large volume reflux that could rapidly reach the pharynx, so the system prepares itself. These are not sequential. As the reflux it comes into the esophagus, the vocal cord closes, the secondary peristalsis is developed, the UES tightens up. If it doesn't work, then the fluid gets into the pharynx, the UES tightens up again, the vocal cord closes. These are all structured to all together protect the airway. If you grow older, you need more volume to trigger this reflex. If you smoke, you need more volume to trigger this reflex. This reflex arch even goes to the glottis itself. This is an example of what we call laryngo UES contractile reflex. So th that little endoscopic view is a little laryngoscope with capability of puffing air through its channel. And we are puffing six uh, air with the pressure applied to the surface of six millimeter of mercury. We are holding it for two seconds. That's very reliable. Shorter than that, you really can't hold it, so you don't know what you're doing. And please see that right on top of it, when you do that, the UES contracts. The same stimulus has been shown by Ravi Mittal, who is here, that reduced, results in LES relaxation. Again, it closes the top, opens the bottom for the refluxate to, to clear. This is in case uh, a refluxate reaches the larynx. Of course, the laryngolaryngeal reflex, which is the laryngeal adductor reflex, is a very important airway protection, and that kicks in after that. Now, how much volume that your larynx can hold safely? How can we do that? Because with all these reflexes. So we have to really anesthetize the pharynx badly, and that's what we did. And you put a catheter in, an endoscope in, and you inf start infusing the pharynx. And you, you need to be sure that you have a suction, suction port there when the fluid gets to the inlet of the larynx. As you see, on the right-hand side, you start suctioning back. On this experimental design, we looked at two things. First, on the right hand, you see the tall uh, bar is the volume of fluid, normal saline in that case, that the pharynx can hold before fluid starts sipping into the larynx in the absence of any reflex. In this case, the subjects are at 45 degrees. We don't know what happens if they are upright. We don't know what's the volume if they are supine. And that's the best we could do. Before the pharynx was anesthetized, we checked all the reflexes. You see pharyngoglottal, pharyngo-UES, reflexive pharyngeal swallow. The volume needed to trigger these reflexes is significantly less than the safe volume of the pharynx. That's the important part. And of course, the triggering can go away with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with anesthetization of the pharynx. Here we are showing what happens in a disease model. So who do we have that their reflexes are impaired? Well, elderly and smokers. So here we compare the smokers with the young, healthy individuals. So blue reflects the normal condition, red reflects frequency stimulation of these reflexes after anesthetizing the pharynx. And as you see, pharyngoglottal closure reflex is very resilient. You can't do much with it. Pharyngo-UES disappears as we saw with the reflex, rapid pharyngeal swallow disappears when you anesthetize the pharynx. And as a result, the subjects develop laryngeal penetration. On the right, so this is experimental uh, impaired condition. On the right, there are naturally impaired condition, the, the smokers. You see pharyngoglottal closure reflex, PGCR, is reproduced 100%. Pharyngo UES next to it is produced 87% with that particular volume. But then the rapid reflexive pharyngeal swallow is diminished to only 20%. So what happens to the other 80%? They aspirate. We don't let them, but the fluid is about to get to the lung and we start suctioning back. 
So that's a pathophysiologic model of these uh, reflexes. And this again shows the, on the left, you see the basal pressure of these groups are the same, but response, namely the reflex, on the, in the smokers are significantly reduced. So, ladies and gentlemen, before I get into trouble with Dr. Richter, I want to summarize. The body protects its airway by about 12 reflexes. The stimulating, the afferent side of these reflexes are scattered through the foregut, in the esophagus, in the pharynx, and in the larynx. In the esophagus, you have the esophagobronchial reflex, esophagoglottal closure reflex, esophago-UES contractile reflex, and secondary and possibly primary peristalsis. On top of the UES in the pharynx, you have reflexive pharyngeal swallow, laryngeal adductor reflex, pharyngoglottal closure reflex, pharyngo-UES contractile reflex. So now we know some of the physiology, probably there are more, and we re rely on our younger colleagues to carry the field, we know a little about pathophysiology, but we need to know more. For example, could abnormal UES response to esophageal fluid distension be a test to see if that can identify patients with LPR? Things like that, now, now that we know the pathophysiology. So the journey has begun, but a long way ahead of us, and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>